Let's give the confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let's greet the person beside us. Let us be like Jesus. With this word, today the message is entitled Unconventional Jesus. Each Sunday, we look, we've been looking at the book of Mark. And we look at Jesus' ministry. And when we look closely, we see how Jesus did his ministry at that time. And if we were to define it in one word, it would be like today's message's title, that it was unconventional. The word unconventional literally means breaking a certain formality. It refers to breaking the old framework of thinking, the paradigms of the past, and showing a new paradigm, a new thinking, a new complete school of thought. Jesus' ministry in one word was conventional, unconventional. Tomorrow is Christmas Day. And Jesus' coming to earth in itself was also unconventional. His entire journey to save humanity was completely different and far from human thoughts. As Philippians chapter 2 says, Jesus is the very embodiment of God. Jesus himself is God. But to save mankind for the salvation of mankind, he became human. God came as flesh and he became human like us. For God to be God Himself, to be informed God means that He is God Himself. Therefore, Jesus, who is God, He humbled and lowered Himself and came to this earth as a man. But how did He come? He came in the form of a servant. The, in Matthew, it said that Jesus who came as king, but in the book of Mark, it said that He came as a servant. But not only that, he humbled and lowered himself to the point of death on the cross. That is Jesus Christ. And this was God's absolute plan for the salvation of mankind. After the first man, Adam, sinned in Genesis chapter 3, all descendants of Adams and all humanity, all human beings, were born in amidst sin and curses and they are bound to run errands for Satan, the prince of the air, to live enslaved by Satan and to wander and eventually to go on the path of eternal destruction. That is the fate of humans. That is how humans are bound to die when they are born. However, God, who is rich in love and mercy, Immediately after the incident of Genesis 3, in instantly after the incident, he made a covenant of the offspring of a woman, not an offspring of a man, not the offspring of an Adam. You and I, we're both offsprings of men. But Jesus is different. He came as an offspring of a woman. Mary, the, the virgin, was conceived, and he came as the offspring of a woman. And he opened the way for the salvation of all humanity. God continued to prophesy through the prophets in the Old Testament. He continuously prophesied that Jesus who will save all humans will come. He will come. It was continuously prophesied in the Old Testament. Matthew 1, 21 to 25 has promised He came to earth. And the day to celebrate that day is tomorrow, Christmas Day. Christmas. And the message about Christmas will be delivered tomorrow. What we must look at carefully is that in order to save humans who had become sinners, He who would come to save them needed to be 100% God and 100% human. And He needed to be a human, but a completely sinless human. All humans have sin, for all have sin and fall short of the glory of God. And Jesus was a human who had no sin. 
So to meet that condition, to meet the condition of a savior, he came to this earth and everything, all of Jesus' journey was unconventional. It was a mystery of God that people had never seen before. And the way God, Jesus showed himself during his public ministry was something that people at that time did not expect at all. It was all very unconventional. It was, we see Jesus' image and his ministry that broke all the traditions and social norms of the time, and that is contained in the four Gospels. So this passage also contains the unconventional ministry of Jesus. This is a scene where he calls Levi, a tax collector, as a disciple, and he eats with the tax collectors and sinners. The reason these two incidents were so unconventional was that this incident was, at that time, was a very significant incident. It completely broke the framework of thinking that Jewish leaders and Israelites had at that time. It completely broke their fixed ideas. With the coming of Jesus, a new era had begun. However, unfortunately, the Jewish leaders at that time were still seized by a legalistic way of thinking. They were unable to come out of that. And it goes the same even to this day. The gospel had come, and yet they're still in legalism. They're still bound by their religious thinking. The more the church, the more and longer they go to church. Even if Jesus had already solved everything, many people are still seized by this legalistic thinking, whether it's right or wrong, and they always criticize. And that's how many people still attend church. It still is the same. The things of the past, the former things, it doesn't mean that they're all necessarily bad. But it's all useless spiritually. Why are you unable to receive grace? Why do you have so many various useless thinking thoughts? And why are you so filled with things that have nothing to do with the gospel? Because of legalism, because of that nature. You, you criticize yourself, you criticize others. You're all, they are all running errands for the devil. They are unable to receive grace. There's no change. There's no growth. There is no growth. And that's how Satan made it to be. Whether it was the times of Jesus or now, it's still the same. Through these two unconventional incidents in the passage today, Jesus shows the perspective of saving lives, a gospel perspective, instead of a perspective of condemnation. Everything is about negative things, about about condemning and everyone is bound by that but God completely changed it, changed the perspective of condemnation to the gospel perspective we must have a spiritual perspective that's different from the unbelievers of this world may you all church one church believers realize the essence of the unconventional mystery that Jesus conveyed and become absolute disciples of Christ that raise up the dynamic movement of life in every field you go to and in every person you meet in the name of the Lord. The number one, Jesus who called a tax collector as a disciple. Verses 13, verse 13 says, He went out again beside the sea and all the crowd was coming to him and he was teaching them. Verse 14, And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. We can see that after Jesus started his public ministry, he continues to proclaim the heavenly gospel, and he also focused on the work of raising disciples that would replace Jesus' ministry in the future. Especially if you look at today's passage, Jesus raised one disciple, and that person was the son of Alphaeus, Levi. Levi is the former name of Matthew, who recorded the book of Matthew. Levi is the one who recorded the book of Matthew. His name had changed. At that time, Levi's job was a tax collector. Today, this job would be equivalent to a tax officer. To the Israelites at that time, a tax collector was someone to completely avoid. 
And the reason for that was that at that time, Israel was a colonized state by Rome. They were a colony of state of Rome. And the Roman government had appointed people from their own people who were well acquainted with the circumstances of the Israelites to be tax officers in order to collect taxes from them more effectively. But an even bigger issue was that they were not just collecting taxes, but as they were collecting these taxes, they would also collect a share for themselves. So the Israelites were suffering even more because of these tax collectors. As a result, tax collectors were branded as traitors to their own people. They were thieves, ones who were sucking the blood out of their own people. They were subjects of scorn, mockery, and hatred in Jewish society. They were the sworn enemy and the number one figure to avoid, the tax collector. However, Jesus called a, this Levi, a tax collector, as a disciple. This was something that went beyond comprehension. Within the societal atmosphere and context of that time, this was the epitome of unconventional. However, if you look at the passage, we see, surprisingly, that Levi, as if he was waiting for Jesus to call him, he immediately followed Jesus. Immediately. In reality, because he was a tax collector, Levi would have lived a financially abundant life. However, his inner state would have been the complete opposite. He su suffered all kinds of contempt from the people of his own kind. So simply put, he would have been covered in scars. It, it was not like he could just quit his job because then he wouldn't have a means to live his life and provide for his life. And so he had become a task collector. But then he was hated by his own people and he couldn't do anything about it. And so he was in that conflict. And in other words, he probably had to live just because he had not died yet. Simply put, Leva's life was, even if he was alive and living, probably one that was not of true, lively living. But then a ray of hopeful light, a hopeful sound shone upon Levi. It was that he had heard the news of Jesus who was performing all kinds of miracles and proclaiming the gospel of heaven. He would have held in his heart that if it's Jesus, he would be someone who would be able to solve all the situations Levi was put in. That is why when Jesus came to his place of work and told him, and told him, follow me, he didn't even hesitate and follow Jesus immediately. The life of Levi that met Jesus immediately changes drastically. His life completely changed. Through the meeting of Jesus Christ, his inner scars, all of that were healed. And the evidence for that is in verse 15 of the passage. Levi was so overjoyed that he invited Jesus and all the disciples to his home and hosted a feast. However, it was not just him, but the other task collectors whom he used to work with and all other sinners who would have been considered to be sinners from the legalistic mindset of Jews were all invited to Levi's place. Levi thought that these people would also have the many scars that he had and that they probably were in difficulty just as he was in. And just as he had tasted healing through Jesus, he wanted them to meet Jesus. This Levi who had tasted healing and restoration and joy after meeting Jesus invited all these individuals to his home. In social psychology, there is something called the stigma effect. And in Korean, it would also be said as a branding effect or a denial effect. 
It describes a phenomenon where individuals, when marked with negative stereotypes and dismissal by others, they tend to behave in a more negative manner. But in contrast, when individuals are positively perceived by others, and acknowledged by others, then they tend to work hard to live up to those positive expectations, and that's called the Pygmalion effect. In Korean, this would be also called an expectation effect, from a dismissal or branding effect to an expectation effect. At that time, Levi was probably in a situation where he was pushed to the brink due to the stigma effect that was placed on him by the Israelites. However, Jesus, 180 degrees, completely overturned the situation. He had expectations for Levi's future, which opened a new door to a new life for Levi. This world is quick to embrace the stigma effect. However, we shouldn't live according to the ways of the world. Although we are a church that is in this world, but we should not do as the world does. The people in the world, they, they condemn, they mock, and they stamp, and they try to oppress others. That's how it is in the world. That's how it is in the workplace. But you shouldn't live that way. Because we live in this world, we have these habits and these natures. And that culture also starts to seep into the church. And it completely destroys the church. That's what happens to many current churches and many churches in the world. Because the ways of the world have seeped into the church. We have to follow Jesus' method. Not the stigma effect, but an expectations effect. We have to save lives. We need to revive people. We need to encourage them. You know, we have to encourage and support others. You may say, oh, pastor, then why don't you encourage us? Because I'm preaching right now. What is a sermon? It has lessons and it, ha it, ha and it is good for teaching and for rebuking and discipline. We have to save and revive others. And so we have to be able to save others. I've never, I've never pushed someone away where if someone left. You have, and you, you with a heart with the gospel, you should be able to embrace everything. You should be able to say, "Oh, that person, they have reasons to be that way." You shouldn't say, "Oh, what is wrong with that person?" and condemn that person. That means that the worldly ways have already seeped into you. And so you have to love everyone, even even those who may be imprisoned, even those criminals. I used to work in the in, in I used to do ministry in a prison, and I've met I've met a prisoner there who had murdered someone, and I thought to myself, I he was so kind, and I thought how could he have killed someone? But then he said that someone kept whispering in his ear to kill, and so and I and. To not kill someone is a worldly law as well. But if you are to continuously resent others and you continuously condemn others, you're completely being seized by murderous thoughts. You're completely seized by the thoughts of Satan. As a child of God that has been saved, if you completely come to church and you completely you continuously hate others and resent other church members, you're completely seized by Satan. How is that a church? How is that the Lord's heart? Levi, after meeting Jesus, his name changed to Matthew, meaning gift of God or God's grace. His name completely changed as well. His life changed. He was once covered in wounds and scars. Now, he experienced a remarkable life turning point by the grace of God. That is what a walk of faith is, to be completely overturned. Even now, there are people in a spiritual state like Levi left attended in the field. People are covered in scars. And there is no other nation that is so covered in scars than Koreans. And so, the Philippines, they are one of the happiest nations in the world. They can live a month with $100 and $200, but they don't have scars. They don't have any inferior complex. 
And so when you see all, all Asians, the you it is so easy to notice who Koreans are because they always have such a serious facial expression. They they're not smiling they, because they're so full of thoughts. There are Japanese, Filipinos, and other Asians. But when it comes to Koreans, you know, they're always so busy thinking about what others might think of them. Even their eyes, they're always full of anxiety and worries. They're always anxious and nervous. But for in, in Japan, you know, it doesn't matter what color, what hair color you might have. They don't care about what others think. But when, when it comes to Koreans, the culture itself is seized and bound by by keeping face, by, by having to compare themselves to others. It's such a, a de demon. There's so, much, uh, there's so much demon culture in it. And so many people are unhappy. And because they're unhappy, everyone's unhappy altogether. They're, although our country may be one of the most economically stable countries, but we have a lot we have an influx of mental problems and people don't acknowledge that and there are many people like this around us who are being left attended you have to give them the answer that jesus the christ the answer to all problems you have to give them answers and heal them you need to be and change them to a spiritual matthew i bless you in the name of the lord that you may change all those who may be covered in scars as spiritual matthews and live a life of a gospel healer Number two, Jesus who came to call the sinners. Verse 16 reads, And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Levi, with his encounter with Jesus, found new hope in his life, he was so overjoyed that he invited Jesus and his disciples to a great feast. And he also invited other tax collectors and friends who were, were in similar situations. And he also invited some sinners too. And they shared a joyful fellowship with Jesus. In the passage, when it says sinners here, it does not refer to those who committed criminal acts but rather it refers to those who may have who may who did not confirm to the legal traditions of the pharisees and scribes at that time naturally the pharisees and scribes should have participated in this joyful event but they just simply looked at the scene of joy with a very serious face because with their legal regulation, regulations, it was not permissible to speak with or even walk with the tax collectors and sinners. That was the law. Why? Because they believed that any contact with these tax collectors and sinners, that the sin that, would, that they had would come to them and that they would be contaminated by that sin. Therefore, for Jesus to dine with these tax collectors and sinners was completely unimaginable from their perspective. It went beyond their comprehension and imagination. How could someone so famous like Jesus eat with those cursed tax collectors and sinners and they and they questioned Jesus' disciples are, why are you eating with these sinners Jesus proclaimed a very important truth to these individuals who were completely seized by legalistic fixed ideas. Verse 17 reads, And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Amen. Jesus gave a clear and un unequivocal answer to the point where they could no longer question him. He said, 
I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus precisely states the reason for his coming on earth. He says that he did not come to for the Pharisees and the scribes who claim to be righteous, self-claimed. They kept saying that, oh, I'm righteous and you sinners. But he, Jesus did not come for those righteous. Jesus says, I came for the sinners. They're self-claimed righteous, right? So a person who mocks and condemns others are like Pharisees. They say that they're always right and others are always wrong. But Jesus had come to heal and restore the sinners. What is the church? The church is a place for where sinners who are mocked and pointed at and scorned by the world should come. The church should invite them and protect them. And that's why there are a lot of problems in the church. Why? Because we have to continuously call those individuals and we have to have them believe in Jesus and change them. And so many people, there are some people, there are some people who, who completely change from a former Levi to a Matthew and there are some people who change halfway or people, some people who don't change at all. So the, all kinds of people come here to the, in the church. And people, all kinds of levels come. How can we, how can we become one? And how could problems not arise? And how could there be no conflicts? Everyone is so different in the church. However, protect what the Holy Spirit has brought together. It is only possible because of the Holy Spirit. It does not come from our own effort, but only those who have received the Holy Spirit. That's possible only for those individuals, and that's why we must receive the word. Otherwise, this is completely impossible. And that's why Satan's easiest target could be the church. So churches could be a church could be a joke for Satan because he can just point to, to someone, to a certain individual and have them run errands for him in the church. However, the gospel is different from the religions of the world. A religious principle generally states, what is a religious principle? They say, a swan must not be where crows are. A swan must not be where crows are. Thus, they have to seek quieter places such as mounds or places with fewer people to engage in their spiritual practices. But it's different for Christianity. Jesus tells us to step into the world of crows and turn them into swans. If they're living lives in darkness, then be the light. And if they're rotting away, be the salt. And the field, the field. There is the, the church field and the field of your workplace, the worldly field. It says that you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the world. Amen. You must shine the light. You are the light. And you have to be the salt. Where? In the field. And people who don't have a field don't understand this. People who are doing ministry with shamans and who are doing the three member team, the team of three movements, but people who don't have a field. And it means that they are not taking upon the role of a light and salt in the field. But that's true for many churches in the world. And the reality of many churches across the globe. The church tells us to, the Bible tells us to go into the world, but people don't do that. There aren't, there is no one. Even to this day, many missionaries are going into the dark fields in the world, but people tend to stay in the church, in their houses, all cozy and comfortably, and they only run errands for Satan. May you take upon the role of the light and the salt in the world. It's not something that you can or cannot do. 
However, this, no, it is the heavenly mandate, calling, and mission that Jesus has given to us. Today's passage that Jesus speaks about shows which direction the church needs to go and clearly shows what the nature of the church must be. Healthy men don't need a doctor. Of course, if you're healthy, you don't need a doctor. Doctors and hospitals exist for the sick. Jesus came to this world to save the sinners as a spiritual doctor. And that is also the reason for the church's existence, to save the sinners. Amen? And so, for our church, we have people with disabilities. They should all come. People who are once in prison, they all need to be saved as well. And people who have fled North Korea, even those fugitives, they need to come here as well. And that is why Jesus raised this church. I believe that our church is a church that pleases God. I emphasized this during last week's 2024 committee member and regional directors joint workshop. One notable feature of 2024 will be the main regional committees. I raised up elders for inside the regional committees. And the church officers and the social pastors need to be established as a team of three and and go into the start 10,000 and 4,000 parts of movement. I said to them to become a covenantal team, a covenantal team. That is so important, to become one with the covenant, to become one with the word. Because only when you become one and one team and oneness will the Holy Spirit work upon us. But if you judge each other and condemn each other, how can the Holy Spirit work upon us? It will be darkness that works upon us. And that is why you must become a covenantal one team. And if that takes place, then that's the end of it. There is no gap for Satan to come into. Our committee directors and regional directors and all these other organizations and departments are not there for administrative purposes, but we're formed for the field. All of the departments for in our church are departments for the field. We have to align all our directions to save the field. And so I told all the committee directors and the regional directors to restore the field first. How? Starts with the five basics by start starting with Tarakbang or upper ministry. It all begins with Tarakbang. What is that? It is to give them answers of their lives. What is the difference between religion and the gospel start with that with the acceptance movement to give them answers and to save them but after COVID it's become a culture where it's not easy to meet people in person or perhaps some people may be too far or some people don't may not have enough time then meet them through face talk or FaceTime nowadays it's all so well set up you can meet them in person through FaceTime and have Darbang instead. Look, look at them face to face. And when you do that, it'll be an equivalent experience to meeting them in person. When the field becomes revived this way, all ministries will flourish as a virtuous cycle. I bless all the members of Yewon Church that in 2024, that in all your footsteps, you may ignite the flame of a spiritual movement of true healing and restoration. Con the conclusion? In the book, a psychologist at the University of Miami, in the School of Medicine, Tiffany Field, said this about in her book, Touch, that touch is one of the most important things when it comes to humans. During the Second World War, in a small town in Italy, there were two orphanages, one across the river and one on the other side. So one orphanage was, uh, was established by the Allies, and they had abundant food, and it was well managed. But the other orphanage on the other side was in poor condition and had limited food supplies and was in a lot of difficulties. However, rather than the children in the orphanage that had good facilities, the children who lived in the other orphanage that 
had poor conditions showed significantly lower numbers of sickness outbreaks or child mortality rates. So researchers investigate this case, how there could be such a vast difference in two completely different orphanages. And they found an interesting fact. The orphanage that had a poor, that, that was built in poor condition, there was a, a woman who had come in, who a woman who had lost her child and who had lost her mind, who had gone crazy, and she had come into the orphans and lived with these children. And every day, she kept, she was under the delusion that all the children in the orphanage w was her child, and she embraced them and gave them affection and hugged them, thinking that they were her child. So she kept embracing them and touching them. But it was that that drew the line between these two orphanages. What children who wanted to, who wanted to grow healthily, what they really truly needed was not good food, but a warm touch of love, a touch of love. This touch of love needs to be the basis for all the ministries of the team of three and the flesh and blood evangelization. Levi, who received Jesus' touch of love, just as he was able to live a new life, may all the church members of Yewon save each other and save other unbelieving souls and become the main figures of spiritual touch. And this I bless you in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, may all the members of Yewon Church be like the unconventional Jesus and may they go beyond the thinking of this world and raise and save up all people with a gospel standard. May they love themselves and love neighbors and share the love of Jesus Christ and become healthy young church members spiritually. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.